Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. And as we deliberate the latest developments here in Israel throughout the region and beyond, it's always important to remember how the war versus Hamas began. 259 days ago, on October 7th of 2023, the Islamist Hamas, alongside its terror affiliates in the Gaza Strip, launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre, murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including elderly, men, women, children, and infants. 120 of them remain in Hamas captivity to date. Subsequently, the next day on October 8th, the Iranian proxy Hezbollah joined the war by launching a projectile, a number of rockets from Lebanon towards Israel. This sparked a decision in Jerusalem to evacuate roughly 60,000 Israeli citizens from border region with Lebanon elsewhere inside Israel. Since then, to date, Roughly 5,000 rockets, missiles, and unmanned aerial vehicles have been launched towards Israel, which Israel has been fighting to confront. With that being said, this staggering number is roughly 1,000 rockets more than what was fired during the entirety of the Second Lebanon War of 2006. Let's now turn to the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, Brigadier General in Reserve, Doron Gavish. It's good to see you, General. Yesterday you cited also launches not only from those two territories. On the 17th of October, of course, we had the Iranian proxy Ansar Allah, which is dominated by the Houthi tribe, joined the fight from Yemen, Hashtashabi from Iraq, Iran proper on April 14th and 13th, launching over 320 projectiles, rockets, cruise missiles, as well as ballistic missiles, and, of course, not to forget, roughly 70 to 80 unmanned aerial vehicles towards Israel with 99% success rate in interceptions, which is quite staggering, of course, and unprecedented in the history of uh, modern warfare. But nonetheless, we are in a situation where a northern conflagration can happen at any given moment with prospects of a negotiated solution diminishing by the day. Well, you're right, uh, Jonathan. Uh, when we're looking uh, to the north and if we're looking uh, for trends, uh, not about, you know, we could see here and there what is happening, but we always have to look on the broader picture and uh, to look on the trends. Uh, it seems that uh, the attacks uh, from uh, both sides, I would say, uh, are uh, more significant, are more into areas that uh, they didn't uh, shot at uh, before. Uh, although it is yet under the, uh, in a way, low uh, threshold uh, war, it is still under this uh, threshold, it is still under the cohesion that uh, the Hezbollah is shooting toward uh, uh, military installations, strategic ones, but not pure to civilians. And this is something that is still being kept, but the numbers are growing, uh, the targets are uh, far more uh, than they were in the past. Again, if we're looking into the trend, which is basically uh, the one situation that uh, we are dealing with. The other situation, and you mentioned it, uh, uh, on your opening statement is that still we have uh, 60,000 uh, Israelis uh, refugees in their own uh, homeland. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, the government of Israel, uh, promised them uh, 1st of uh, September or September 1st that they would be um, uh, able to go back. This is a day that, as we know, kids go back to school. Uh, I think that uh, today, if you would ask most of the people, uh, they don't believe that uh, this would be the situation on the 1st of uh, September. Uh, there was also a poll that uh, this was the result of it. Uh, so at the end of the day, there is uh, a bit of uh, mistrust, I would say, by those people that uh, are being evacuated from the northern part of Israel. And not only this, because uh, also those that are staying in this uh, part of the uh, of our country, 
uh, we have to say that uh, the economy situation is very bad. Uh, our northern uh, part of uh, Israel is mainly relied on uh, tourism. There is non-tourism uh, today, so the economical pressure from one side, the, the pressure from uh, uh, the, the people themselves, the situation uh, with the Hezbollah, the military situation with the Hezbollah, you combine all of those uh, together and it looks like uh, we are aiming toward the uh, confrontation. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is uh, the question if, if or do we have another uh, solution, a diplomatical solution or something like this? And this is also something that uh, we could say is uh, we don't see a real prospect uh, there. Uh, we know that there was a discussion between the uh, United States and Lebanon, and the Israeli message was conveyed that uh, uh, we, are, we are giving this uh, uh, diplomatic uh, solution chance for another few uh, weeks. Uh, but if it won't work, uh, we would uh, use uh, other means. This is something that is being backed by the United States. So, of course, this is another indication that uh, we could go uh, in, in a matter of uh, not too long from now uh, to a military confrontation into the uh, northern part of uh, Israel. And of course, and this is something that I could, uh, of course, uh, from my personal uh, knowledge, I could say the IDF is uh, prepared for it. Uh, the IDF uh, finished uh, all his uh, training, uh, which was necessary. Uh, and uh, basically, it is ready for uh, such a confrontation. Once again, uh, we prefer that uh, it would be done uh, quietly, voluntarily by the Hezbollah, uh, drawing from the uh, southern part of uh, Lebanon to uh, uh, what is known the 1701 resolution, uh, UN resolution. Uh, but uh, I'm not uh, too optimistic that that's what will happen. Indeed. And let's now turn to elsewhere in central Israel, where we're joined by Brigadier General in Reserve, you'll see. Kupil Vassil, formerly the Director General of the Israeli Ministry of Strategic uh, Affairs, a uh, head of the IDF Intelligence Directorate at uh, uh, the Research and Assessment uh, Division, as well as a long list of other positions, including, of course, the Director for uh, the Middle East Project at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. It's good to see you, General. I'd like to ask you, particularly about uh, what General Kavish just highlighted, uh, the intense complexity at hand. Negotiations are taking place. And as uh, Mr. Hochstein noted, uh, the U.S. envoy, that there are two options from a diplomatic perspective. The one is finding some sort of resolution in which Israel would once again engage in concessions uh, towards the Lebanese uh, as a honeycomb for Hezbollah to uh, to acquiesce to a certain de-escalation. Seems like uh, this uh, uh, endeavor is more of a protection kind of payment uh, within the criminal sphere since uh, Hezbollah is uh, naturally a criminal organization. But the other element is uh, finding a negotiated solution to end the conflict uh, in Gaza, particularly a temporary ceasefire, which the Americans and their partners around the region uh, and the world uh, highlight will then be worked upon to expand and, and work upon for a broader uh, resolution, of course, uh, without specifying what that actually means. But... Nonetheless, there doesn't seem to be any recipient on Hamas's side to agree to such a resolution since it seems like the leader of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Yahya Sinwar, is very, very much uh, eager to continue the fight since he highlighted, according to a number of reports, that he has Israel exactly where he wants. Now, what a, does that actually mean? I'd be eager to hear your thought on it. Well, I think that uh, what is going to decide where we're going is the position of the American administration. And uh, the policy that uh, they have adopted is to uh, put an end to the, to the fight in the, in the Gaza Strip and to avoid the confrontation in, uh, in Lebanon. And as long as this is the policy that are going to be uh, implementing on the field, 
it's going to be difficult to reach to both those goals. Actually, this is uh, just uh, counterproductive, this, uh, this policy, because as long as uh, Sinwar believes that uh, the United States is uh, trying to stop Israel before, before it uh, defeated, defeats Hamas, then he has all the reasons in the world to stay uh, stubborn and uh, uh, deny the uh, deal that is presented by Israel. And uh, as long as this is going on, the Hezbollah in, in Lebanon does, doesn't have an interest to stop the war again. And uh, because uh, the, what they fear is that uh, Israel will uh, go into a much wider, uh, more escalative uh, war, uh, in which they're going to suffer very uh, difficult uh, damages to, to their assets. And uh, but as long as the Americans are not behind Israel, they believe that Israel is not going to launch this kind of war, because as uh, we hear from everybody. Uh, Israel needs the American support for such a war, especially from the point of view of armament, but it's beyond that. Now, the Americans are sending mixed uh, messages. There are uh, signs that uh, the Americans are sending more uh, uh, military power in, in, uh, to the region, uh, with the USS Ford coming in. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, this ongoing debate between Israelis and Americans is taking place in the, in the United States as we speak, uh, between the uh, Israeli delegations that came there, headed by uh, Minister Dermer and uh, advisor, National Security Advisor uh, Tzafi Anegbi. And uh, they are trying to convince the Americans to, to change policy. But what we hear from uh, the Americans is that they, they repeated the f all known, the well known uh, messages uh, again and again and again. So there's no progress in that, and this means that uh, the war in Gaza will continue because there's not going to be a possibility to reach an agreement that is satisfactory from, from an Israeli point of view. And because of that, the war in Lebanon is going to continue as well, and might escalate because Israel, in the context of the war in Lebanon, takes harsh measures against Hezbollah operatives. We hear every second day about uh, targeted killing of uh, one of them. And uh, this brings his, uh, Hamas, uh, sorry, Hezbollah to uh, retaliate heavily. And eventually, one of these uh, retaliations is going to be too successful and uh, force Israel to act uh, in a harsher measure, manner. And uh, this is going to be translated into a, some sort of uh, an escalation that's going to be even more difficult to keep it uh, from turning into a wide scale war. And uh, that's where we stand right now. Uh, luckily, we are still in a controlled escalation in the north, but it's becoming more and more difficult to keep it controlled. And that's what, uh, and just in order to keep it controlled, Israel mounts the uh, volume of its uh, threats to uh, to Hezbollah, so that uh, Hezbollah will be more careful. Uh, and but eventually, if it's not going to be more careful, Israel is going to be committed to uh, come through on its uh, threats, and so is going to be Nasrallah. He also. Uh, escalates the threats, and we saw the, the threat against uh, Cyprus, and uh, everybody is carried away with, with their own uh, with their own threats, and becomes more committed to a wider scale war. Even though I don't think anybody wants it. Actually, there is a, a very interesting reality in which Cyprus is actually under the protection of the United States, agreed upon. Uh, during the Trump administration, they, they established uh, clear parameters on this. And also, of course, the French. The French have uh, their interests with Greece, uh, which, uh, of course, brought them to uh, highlight to Turkey when the tensions were between Ankara and Athens at a whole time uh, high that uh, Paris would also stand by Cyprus, uh, something that, of course, uh, will raise questions. Where does uh, Paris stand when we're talking about two nations under its protection, supposedly the one, the Lebanese state that is on the verge of crumbling, and the other, Cyprus, if the Iranian proxy Hezbollah would decide to launch uh, its uh, attacks against uh, Nicosia and the adjacent uh, cities and towns. But General uh, Gavish, uh, General Kupilvasa highlighted that this Escalation is still controlled. Uh, of course, uh, escalation dominance uh, is uh, usually very tricky, and there are different concepts to it and different tables. 
uh, or ladders, if, if I may refer to it as such. But uh, we're looking at a controlled escalation that may, again, uh, bring about a reality in which not only Hezbollah engages Israel, but also the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, I had the opportunity to speak with a senior American official early this morning, actually late last night, uh, during the course of which he told me, and after asking him, would the United States step in in the event that Iran joins to fight with uh, Hezbollah against Israel? And his answer was an unequivocal yes. Is this something that we should take as reassuring? Well, um, if it comes to Iran, I believe that the answer is yes. Um, we have to remember that this is what we are trained for or training for in the last uh, more than 20 years. I mean, this is the exact scenario that uh, Israel and the United States are uh, uh, talking about. It, it took some other angles during the last uh, two years, but it was always uh, about uh, about Iran. So I think that when it comes to the Iranians, to the, the Iranians, if they would uh, attack Israel uh, for sure, um, I believe that the United States uh, would be part of the coalition or leading a coalition uh, that uh, would be part of uh, uh, this fight as a defenders uh, of uh, Israel. Uh, we saw it, by the way, on the 14th of April. This is exactly. Uh, what would happen uh, that uh, the United States, uh, together with some uh, other countries, uh, or the United States was leading the coalition of, uh, of uh, some countries and um, intercepted a vast number of uh, projectiles that were coming toward Israel and uh, did it uh, very far away from, uh, uh, from our homeland. So personally, I think that uh, if Iran uh, would be part of this fight, uh, United States uh, would uh, step forward. But we have to say, United States is already here. It is not something that they need to make uh, too much uh, decisions. Uh, we have to remember that uh, there is a vast deployment of uh, United States of the Central Command in the Mediterranean. Uh, we're talking about ships, missiles, uh, um, um, air defense uh, assets, uh, air force uh, assets, and uh, others. So. It is not even uh, very hard. It doesn't uh, um, need uh, too much, uh, um, you know, deployment uh, toward this region because most of the assets are already here. Uh, so this is also from the military, from the pure military uh, point of view. And uh, we have to say, you know, openly that this is uh, what Israel and the United States are preparing to. This is what we are training to. And uh, this is... Uh, what we are aiming uh, if uh, such a threat uh, would occur from uh, from Iran. And unfortunately, uh, I think that the Iranian uh, also already uh, crossed the Rubicon after the 14th of April. So I think that this is uh, for sure something that uh, we should uh, prepare for, that uh, if we would see uh, or if we would be in a position of fighting against the Hezbollah, uh, probably Iran would become a part of it. You used the word defensive, in defense of Israel, if I quote you word for word. And uh, that is something that uh, I'll cling to with uh, General Kupelwasser now, since the United States, under the current administration, repeatedly highlights that it will stand in support of Israel's defense, rather than beyond that. Uh, and... Does that indicate the line of that policy that you referred to where they're unwilling to cross the, the line since the assets are here, but we all know that this uh, the, the quantity of assets and the deployment that is public knowledge, everybody knows what is in the region and there the various uh, uh, laws that provide for, of course, the, the broad sch scheme of, of uh, uh, U.S. posture in the region. Uh, it is a defensive posture. It's not an offensive one. Can Iran be held accountable in such a situation, knowing full well that the United States has not deployed here an offensive posture to put it in its place? Well, first of all, I think that uh, the, this policy of the United States is going back uh, a very long while. 
never had the United States supported the Israeli offensive operations. And wherever we were trying to convince them to carry out some offensive operations that were in line with both their interests and ours, they were very cautious and uh, go back to the case of the uh, Iraqi uh, nuclear reactor or the Syrian nuclear reactor and, uh, and other cases uh, along the years. And this was the case also with the Israeli retaliation. So what is probably the Israeli retaliation to the Iranian attack on uh, April 14th, that took place on April 19th this year, uh, the Americans uh, made it clear that they had nothing to do with this uh, retaliation and uh, they were not involved in it and actually made it clear right from the beginning, even before it uh, took place, that they are not going to be involved in uh, any offensive uh, steps against uh, Iran, even though two minutes uh, before that, Iran launched 350 projectiles towards Israel. So they helped us in uh, protecting ourselves uh, against those uh, projectiles, but they were, they were saying we were not going to participate in anything offensive. So th this is not something new. This is an old uh, policy. The point is that when you talk about Iran, there are two cases here. One is the case of Iran trying to hit Israel, and that uh, would leave probably the United States at the same place. But the other is what happens if the Iranians decide to break out to a, to a bomb because of all kinds of considerations. And we all know how close they, they are to having the capability to build a bomb within a very short period of time without doing everything in order to shorten this time even farther. And, uh, and, and nuclear Iran is not only a threat for Israel. Many in, in the United States believe this is an Israeli problem. So uh, we'll support the Israelis uh, when they are attacked once they do something about the Iranian nuclear project. But uh, this is not an Israeli problem. This uh, should be an American problem just as well. And uh, one would expect the Americans to do something. The Americans keep some uh, ambiguity regarding what they are going to do. I think we are not going to allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. That's nice. Uh, but they are getting so close that uh, you might not have the capability to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. And uh, so you might have to, to do something. And Israel is committed not to, have, not to let Iran have the capability to produce a nuclear weapon. And it's already very close to having this capability. So it's a, it's a different matter of what you do about Iran. Besides what you do about their attempt to, uh, have the, to become the hegemonic power in the, in the Middle East and uh, through their proxies and everything they do in order to build a ring of fire around Israel, what they have already been doing and uh, what they plan to do in the future, I think that we are all worried about uh, potential steps by Iran vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Judea and Samaria areas, the Palestinian Authority, and even against uh, in, in the context of uh, Jordan. These are all things that call for uh, uh, very active American policy to prevent that from happening. And this is going, if anything of this is going to happen, this is going to be a major blow to American interests, not only, not only to Israeli interests. And uh, I, I, I believe that uh, the Americans will have to, to sit back to the drawing table and uh, ask themselves, so what are we going to do about the growing strength of Iran? Because their policy until now allows Iran to gain more and more power in the Middle East. So you have to adopt a more uh, confrontational policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran in order to prevent that from happening. The, the, the way they repeat how much they are committed not to uh, allow uh, wide-scale war is interpreted as weakness and uh, plays into the hands of the Iranians. And that's a major problem that we are all facing, you know, not, only, not only Israel, but it's, uh, it's the problem of the United Saudi Arabia, the problem of the United Arab, Arab Emirates, the problem of Jordan, the problem of many, many people in the Middle East who are concerned about the growing strength of Iran. I, I'm very concerned uh, from uh, a, a military standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a global rules-based order standpoint. Uh, the, the implications for the United States are going to be dire on the international stage, and it's going to have direct impact also on the no domestic scene, uh, while the, the domestic scene will not necessarily realize it until it's too late, but uh, we don't have and very much time. That, if I can add a word here, uh, Mr. Zarif, former uh, foreign minister of, uh, of Iran, in a presidential uh, candidate uh, uh, debate in, in, in Tehran uh, a couple of days ago, pointed out that what uh, saved the Iranian economy was the 
weak uh, implementation of the sanctions, American sanctions against Iran, uh, ever since the Biden administration came into power. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is how the, the Iranians see the situation. I'm not saying that it is right or wrong, but that's how the, some Iranian officials, former officials, see the situation. And that's very problematic. I, I'm actually not overly concerned of, about that aspect. Uh, what I'm concerned about, and this is something that two days ago Colonel Joel Rayburn, uh, who was here on the show, said that when, you know, in, in 88 there was Operation uh, Praying, uh, Praying Mantis in, in uh, the Strait of Hormuz when the Iranians tried to block the strait and the Americans sunk uh, 50% of its navy. Uh, in a single day, which uh, indicated the the balance of power. Of course, uh, the Americans could have obliterated it, uh, all of it in one day. But uh, the the point being is uh, the fact that the Americans are not reacting to Ansar Allah, the Houthis, blocking Bab el Mandeb in a more efficient way is going to have implications for the rest of the world, including to the east. When we're talking about the South China, uh, China Sea and, and adjacent straits and waterways, it's going to have implications when we're talking about the current policy vis-a-vis Israel and the current policy also uh, vis-a-vis the Hejaz, the Gulf Arab nations, is going to have implications to the European nations, to the African nations. And we're seeing what happened in Niger. Don't forget that a day before October 7th happened, CNN was reporting about the fact that the Americans were deciding to accept the fact that a coup was happening in Niger, where the French and the Americans were getting kicked out. At the expense, of course, uh, the not the expense, they were getting kicked out because of Russia and Iran getting in and sweeping into the country. And this is happening across the board. So we need to understand that strong leadership, strong policy is necessary in order to compete on the global stage. And unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem to me, at least right now, that this is the case. But, uh, General Gavish, last sentence is yours. Well, I think uh, going into this uh, weekend, uh, we talked about uh, the northern part of Israel, but uh, still there are some uh, challenges in the south part of uh, Israel. Uh, Of course, the Philadelphia and uh, Rafah and uh, those areas. Unfortunately, another uh, two soldiers, uh, reserve soldiers, uh, were killed uh, yesterday. One of them, by the way, a son of an uh, Olympic uh, medalist who is uh, well known yeah. in Israel. And uh, a lot of people uh, really loved him. loved him. He was the first uh, Olympic medalist in judo. So he's uh, well known as, uh, unfortunately, his son uh, died. So, uh, and, uh, and we see it, uh, that the, the fight in the south part of Israel is continuing. So uh, we talked about strategy. We talked about Iran. We talked about uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon. Uh, but Aza and Gaza is, uh, is still there. Absolutely. Well, may the Lord grant the, their families comfort. That's uh, all we can say, of course. And uh, the cost of liberty is is quite dire. I'd like to thank General Kupelvaso, General Gavish, for your insights and time. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well and wish you a Shabbat Shalom from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. My name is uh, Doron Gavish and my background uh, 30 years of uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force. My last job I was the commander of the Israeli Air and Missile Defense uh, during the uh, introduction of the Iron Dome to the Defense of Israel. All of this allows me really to be part of the team here in uh, TV7. It is uh, super important to have uh, such a platform and we talk about the global situation. We talk about Israel and those different angles which are relevant to the discussion.